That was a good praise song, absolutely. Well, it's good to see you today. Uh, if we can just make it through all the vacations right now, right? My Sunday school class, those youngsters, those uh, young people are off gallivanting around. Some of you have just got back from gallivanting around, right? Maybe some of you are going to gallivant in a couple of weeks. Hope you have a wonderful time. If you do, everybody needs a break and um, we need some rest. Although if you're like me, sometimes vacation does not result in rest, only stress. <laughs> so hopefully that's not the case with you, but it is good to see you today. We, I think Alan mentioned the folks that we need to pray for, so let's do continue to pray for Doug. Doug's struggling with... Um, with having seizures after his biopsy, and uh, they got to make sure that's over with because they're pretty traumatic when he has one. Uh, medication's been changed, and hopefully that will be solved. Uh, Faye Lell's at home. Uh, good news there. Faye had her surgery, and no treatment is required after that. So that's a blessing, I know. Uh, so continue to remember her. I think Alan also mentioned the uh, family of Rita Fraley, who passed away. Uh, no arrangements now, but be in prayer for them, as many of you know them. Also, I want to let you know, I was going to see if, if this is a laser. I don't guess it is. I was going to blind somebody, but no, I wouldn't do that. It's a flashlight with uh, written engineering on here. And the key, it looks like a house key. It was found in the parking lot. So if this is yours, it is right here, okay? So I'm sure somebody has dropped it, and um, if you're missing that, there it is, all righty? Okay, let's find 1 Peter chapter 3. Man, is this, uh, is this passage uh, insightful or what? The change that's occurred in Simon Peter's tone is... It, in, in the minds of many, one from bad to worse, he, talks to, he, he gives these folks who are undergoing persecution the prescription of submission. It's not how we think, but that's what the Bible says. Um, and he moves from that idea of submission to, uh, to this idea of, of how to behave, how to govern yourself, how to allow the Holy Spirit to govern you when you are suffering. You know, suffering brings out the worst in us, doesn't it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm always amused when people say, I can't believe I said that. Why not? It's been in there for a long time. That's who you are. That's who I am. When we say something, that's simply, you know, drawing up in the bucket what's down in the well. That's what you're doing. Um, and nowhere is that more telling than when we are in periods of either persecution, suffering, or when things are not going our way. You really don't know what's inside of a person until they are squeezed. When, when you're squeezed, when the pressure comes, then what happens is telling. You will know more about yourself after a period of hardship than at any other time in your life. If things are going well, it's going to suit you all the time, it's no big deal to act like a Christian. It's no, uh, no big deal to exhibit the qualities of a spirit-filled life. But when things are not to your liking, that's when people find out, and you find out, what's inside. And so, with that in mind, Simon Peter's directions here make a lot of sense, don't they? Now, the first thing we talked about was the, were the qualities that he he gives beginning in verse 8 um, there are qualities of a of a congregation that is a blessing not every church is a blessing just because you're active and you've got things going on everywhere doesn't mean you're spiritual doesn't mean you're a blessing to the world now we're called to be a blessing as he says here in this passage both to the world and to each other that's our calling. He states that. Now, we're going to come back and examine that more, and I think we've already done that to this point, but he begins with qualities of a covenant body that truly is a blessing. How many of you believe your church is a blessing to you? I do. You guys are a blessing to me. That what, what other quality do you want? Past that? If, if that's stated, that is our our calling you got to begin there if you don't have that if going to church is a drudgery it's there's either a problem with the church or with you 
Amen? Somewhere. Now, if they're a blessing to you, then you in turn are called to be a blessing to them. And some of Peter says as much. We'll, we'll read that in a second. But look at verse 8 as he begins this list of qualities of a congregation or a body that truly is a blessing. During times of persecution. Which fits our day really well, doesn't it? You say, we're not persecuted. Mm, no, not yet physically, not yet with laws that say it's unlawful to, to assemble or to be a Christian. But we are on the fringe of persecution by people who want to govern how we think and how we interpret the Bible. Now, either you, you're going to have to believe the Bible and live by the Scriptures or by the world. There's no in between. If you're a friend to the world, then you're the enemy of God. The Scriptures say that, don't they? If you are a friend of God, by necessity, you will be an enemy of the world. Not that you hate the world. The world will never embrace you or will never uh, engulf you in love and kindness or approval. And one of the things I think that American Christians have absolutely wrong, and God's having to wean us from this. Now, I, you guys probably get tired of me saying this, but that is part of my call, is that the mindset of the American church is unbiblical in so many ways. And one of the ways is this. We expect the approval of this society. We're fighting for that. Some of you got excited about the Supreme Court ruling the other week, and rightfully so. Wonderful first step. We should praise God for that. But you do realize all that did was kick it back to the states, and now the real fight begins. Right? Who are you going to elect this fall in your general legislature in North Carolina? Huh? Because if, if you elect, if our citizens elect a majority of pro-choice, then abortion will never be abolished in North Carolina. But is that the goal of the Christian life? Is that the end all, be all, do all? No, it's not. Should we fight for that? Yes. But do we really expect the world to agree with what the Bible says and our convictions that are a result of believing what the Bible says. Do you expect that? No. And by the way, that's not the test of the success of Christianity. Christianity's never been embraced by the world. Whenever it is, it's always diluted and polluted. Always. It always hurts Christianity when the world says, hey, it's great to be a Christian. So what we're seeing today is an increased pressure, at least in the way we think, that says you can't think like that. You can't believe that these things are right or wrong. You can't hold these priorities. You've got to have our priorities. That's what we're being told. So as this progresses, how are we going to reflect the grace of God that is in us? That's the point of this. And that's what I want you to see. And that's why it's so applicable. So having said that, we talked about the very first quality last week and I, I don't they probably don't have that on the screen it's okay but the first one is Christian unity verse number eight finally be you all of one mind now that's that's a particular way of putting it we talked about that it's not it's not unity based on feelings or 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 sentimentality it's unity based on truth because what do you do with your mind I know what some of you don't do with your mind boy what are you supposed to do with your mind think so Christianity theology is about thinking it's not about feeling you you make it about feeling you're in left field before you know it and more about that in a second because we've taken the words of scripture and twisted them to make it all about you know virtues and and how we are to present justice and those kind of things. And I'll explain that in a second. But that Christian unity has to happen first. Now the mess we're in is that there's so many divergent opinions about what the Bible actually says. 
I have my own opinions about what the Bible says, and I can back up every single one of them with proof. I hope you are able to do that yourself. And I also realize that sometimes in the scriptures, there are two truths that seem to be opposing, but they exist in scripture in a harmony. Only God can do that, by the way. And sometimes we just got to suck it up and say, hey, I don't know how they're both true, but God said it, so I have to believe it. Now, that unity is threatened today by so many divergent opinions on the gospel itself. We've lived forever with different denominations, right? We look at the Methodists as if they don't know what they're talking about. They look at us as if we don't know what we're talking about, and we might not in some way, some things. We look at other denominations, and denominations blow our mind. But you need to understand, denominations are not about just grouping together in the, in the beginning. They were about truth, about convictions, okay? So... They're not bad. They really reflect people's conviction. But what we have today are so many different opinions and convictions on things that don't matter. And we separate over those things. And then you have some people who want to stand up and sound all, you know, rainbows and whatever, and say, well, we just got to love each other and ignore the differences of conviction on truth that do matter. So here's what I think we got to do. When an issue doesn't matter, when you, it's not a hill you die on, don't separate over that. It's crazy. You know, people separate over convictions about the return of Christ. Do you know that? Most of you grew up in a period of time where everybody believes in a pre-trib, pre-millennial rapture. Fine. I grew up that way. But... Can another person believe something different than that while still believing what the Bible says that Christ is returning and you still love them and have fellowship with them? You better be able to do that because that's a secondary issue. He is coming. Amen? When? I don't know and you don't either. And we don't really know the exact order of events. And anybody that claims they do is trying to create a system that really doesn't exist. I'm sorry. I'm not going to separate fellowship over that. But the American gospel, which is prosperity and word of faith, speaking things into existence, NAR, New Apostolic Reformation stuff, dominionism where we believe it's God's will that we conquer every aspect of society. Number one, none of that's in the Bible. But number two, that is what most people in America believe today if you find people who are not Baptists and who are not very close and kin to what you believe more often than not you start talking to them they're going to start talking about this teacher or that teacher and how they just love this person that person and when you do a little research you find out none of it's biblical what they're doing is following after somebody who tells them that the more they obey hey God's going to give you everything you want <laughs> pretty ironic since Jesus himself said, look, you follow me, don't expect to be, you know, don't expect it to be cushy. Don't expect it to go well or smooth. I don't, I don't even have a house to lay down in. You follow me, it's like this. We've forgotten that today. So, but when it comes to solid, consistent, overlapping belief in the gospel, the true gospel, that ought to keep us together with people who believe that. And especially in a church, you want to make it about a church, you got, it's got to be about a church. Christian unity in the church, if it's not over doctrine, drop it. If it, the difference is not over doctrine, drop it. Every single time. All right? You have to. Why? Because they're watching. They're watching. You leave this place and criticize, uh, a person leaves their church and criticizes the community, you can't recover from that. You can't recover from that damage. Peter said when the pressure's on, the first thing you have to mind is that you have to be of the same mind. Now the second thing. Here's what he says in verse 8. Finally be you all of one mind. And by the way, I love Simon Peter when he says finally. You notice that that's in the middle of chapter 3 and there's two more chapters after that. He was a Baptist preacher, right? 
Secondly, having compassion one of another. Now, I'm going to do a little word game with you here. The King James translates this word, compassion. While it's not wrong, there's a better idea, a better word. Because there's another word later on that's going to be better translated, compassion, believe it or not. So this word is more akin, rather than compassion, to the idea of sympathy. Christian sympathy. When you are pressured, have sympathy. Now what does that mean? Now compassion and sympathy are definitely tied together, except compassion is going to be singled out in just a couple of words later. This word has two elements to it, a, a prefix and a main body. The two words put together, the first part of it means together or with. The second part of it begins suffering or, or is, is defined suffering or misfortune. So put that together, you put your thinking cap on for a second, what does this word mean? It means suffer together interesting that is what sympathy literally is now can you think of something more important than or applicable for Simon Peter to bring up than this to a group of persecuted believers know how to suffer together Here's what I think that means. First of all, there's a range of sympathy. The Bible de defines it for us. Romans chapter 12, verse 15, something we looked at a few months ago, says this, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Now, what's the spectrum there? What's the gamut, if you will, defined in that verse? Well, it goes from one extreme to the other, right? When people are happy, be happy with them. When they are weeping over suffering or tragedy, weep with them as well. Why would he say that? Because every single one of us and every single one of them knew what it was to rejoice at great blessings. They knew what it was to weep at great sorrow. And our sympathies are to run the gamut from good to bad. We are called to sympathize. First of all, at the, I'll give you a little list here. Have you ever thought about sympathizing in a good way? We don't define the word that way because it's become all negative. We think of sympathy. Here, here's our extent of sympathy, unfortunately. If something bad happens, we see a person, we'll express our sympathy. We'll send them a card. We will phone, you know, give them a phone call, uh, tell them we're praying for them. None of those things are wrong. But that's only the, the surface of what... Peter is getting at here. What he's talking about is you as in a body of Christ. Guys, this doesn't make sense outside of a church. None of this means anything outside of a church, okay? You with me? So let's talk about it in a positive way. Know how to, based on Romans 12, we are to sympathize when something happens that brings happiness to somebody else. In other words, we rejoice with them. <laughs> Don't always see that, do you? Uh, one of the first signs of jealousy is when something really good happens to somebody. And then your response is, well, yeah, but you know, look at it this way. Well, they don't deserve that. Or yeah, well, I guess they're in debt. Or yeah, all, this, all these other things that we typically say. Why have we lost the ability to rejoice with somebody? Why? Because of jealousy and envy. Let's just be honest. In America, where we're so materialistic, we, we are offended. We resent when somebody else experiences great things in their life. We tend to do that. And I think Simon Peter is just building on what the Bible already says. Even when things are good, sympathize. In other words, rejoice with them. At the same time, getting more about what we usually think, and by the way, we are to re rejoice, sort of covered both of these, with the blessings of others. Do you ever sympathize with somebody when they sin? 
most of the time, our reaction is, well, I wonder what they did to deserve, you know. I wonder what God's going to do to them now. You know, you watch. God's going to get them for that. What does it mean to sympathize when somebody sins? Here's what it means. It does not mean you approve of it. But it means you understand who you are. You and I are sinners, saved by God's grace. Without him, we have no hope of ever doing anything worthy of being called righteous whatsoever. And the only reason any of us do not fall into irreparable sin when we go home today is because the grace of God will keep us from it. That's the only reason. It's in every one of us to murder somebody. It's in every one of us to commit adultery. It's in every one of us, in our sinful nature, the capacity in our sinful nature to commit the most heinous sin you can imagine, but for the grace of God. Now, what does it mean to sympathize? When somebody fails, you don't get all critical. And in your mind say, well, I knew that was coming. Be honest, that's what you say, right? Well, I knew this was going to happen. You can see that coming, right? And then sometimes we might be surprised. Well, I never saw that coming. <laughs> Why? They're human beings. What are you going to say when you fall into some sin? Or I fall into some sin? What are we going to say? Are we going to say, well, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> you should have. Because that's who we are. And to sympathize with somebody who sins, understands. It's to understand that except for the grace of God, that's me. When's the last time you walked up to the store and outside that store was a young man uh, picking invisible things off of his arms, off of his body, no teeth left, just rocking back and forth and totally upset and troubled. And we know what that is. That's meth addiction. You can spot it a mile away. The last time you walked by somebody like that, what did you think? What was in your mind? Now, part of the time, some of this makes it almost impossible in certain situations for us to actually do anything about it. Meth is, is a drug, like many drugs, just way beyond the gateway drug. Just a drug that actually clenches onto a person's mind that will not let go. It's, the most, it's probably the worst thing that's ever happened to humanity, the extent of, of illegal drug use today. How do you sympathize with somebody like that? You know what's happened is that most of us have turned that frequency off. We just reached over and we've turned it off. And when we walk by them, we think, nothing I can do anyway. So, you know, why? He, he's, he's asking for money to buy something. This is a guy that, that hangs out around McDonald's all the time. I'm not telling you how to stop and give him something, but would you? He's not going to do any better if you give him something, probably. Tell him you're praying for him. Give him a track. He might just use it to write something on. Who knows? But in your heart and in mine, what is our initial reaction? That's what I'm getting at. You're the only one who knows that. I'm the only one who knows what's in my heart. Is it to go wide of that person in some cases because of concerns of, of physical safety? That's not a bad option. But in other cases, are we still intent on ignoring and walking around it? We'll never solve the addiction problem till the world ends. I'm convinced of that. But Simon Peter says, sympathize. Because you know that apart from the grace of God, that's you. Do we sympathize when somebody has grief? Well, this is where most of the time we think we do. And we, you know, we, we visit funeral homes. We tell people we love them. We might take them a meal. We might check on them every once in a while. And that's good. That's good. At the same time, do you think that perhaps we've even become a little desensitized to that? You could ask some other things. I have misfortune. They lose their job. Well, it's just the economy. You know, I got to look after my own. I got to take care of this. I got to take care of that. The, the, the church in Acts chapter 2 through 4, they're in a tough situation. They couldn't just walk away and say, well, they lost their job. I got to hang on to what I got because I got to take care of my own. The Bible says they were actually selling what they had and putting it together so nobody starved to death. If things got bad enough in our country, 
How do you think the Miller Bridge Road would handle that? I'll tell you what happened. Families were grouped together. Patrons of that family would stand guard over what they got with a shotgun. I know how it happened. Part, part and I have talked about this. Uh, we, we together, well, he read a novel, I read it later. This, uh, this fictional account of uh, magnetic field being detonated over the United States by nuclear bombs, all of your electronic stuff went, <laughs> it was gone. Okay, some of y'all would die that day because your phone wouldn't come on. So we wouldn't worry about you. And the rest of you would die because the cable was out. So you, we take care of that in a hurry, right? Okay, but have you imagined what would happen if something like that occurred on Interstate 40 and everybody's car stopped? You know how many people come past the Eigert exit on Interstate 40 every single day that ain't from around here? That don't act like us, look like us, or think like us? Yeah, we'd be sitting there with our shotguns at the door, man. Because people be walking up this road finding something to eat. Okay, here's the real kicker. Your car wouldn't work. Because all the new stuff past certain dates got electronic ignition. But you're the one with an antique. It still runs. What do you do? You hide that thing is what you do. Right? What are you going to do? Because people find out and they come looking for it. Man, you say, well, that's not really going to happen. But what if it did? What if that real pressure was applied in that way to the church? What would be our response? Brother Phil's got a pasture full of cows for a little while. <laughs> that happens. Those people make it to the end of uh, George Hildebrand or in the middle of Ridge Road and turn left. They're going to find some cows. Not to mention the chickens, right? What are they going to do? They're going to take them. You say, you're making stuff up. Okay. It's happened before. What if it happened again? How would we, your Christian faith would find, you'd, you'd find out, we would find out. I'm not pointing a finger at you. I'm saying to all of us, we'd find out what our faith really means. Because <laughs> sitting in church and looking nice a few times a week is not the expression of true biblical Christianity. That's nice. I was putting on my suit this morning. I thought, you know, I wish I was a contemporary church. I wouldn't have to do this. Not really. But, I mean, we, we got this idea where, you know, we got to look a certain way and act a certain way on Sunday. And the rest of the week, we'll just let it fly. And however we want it to be. Sympathy. So I guess what I'm asking is that you look in your own heart. Play through those scenarios. There's, the range of sympathy is from rejoicing. To sorrow. But then there's also the reality of sympathy, and here it, here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, where this would play out is not necessarily, because again, the context here, he doesn't say here that we are to sympathize with the world. Now, we would have to. We understand that. Christ did. That's the, that's the Christianity on display. But this is the context of the body. Now listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And where the one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, there you go, you got the gamut right there, suffering to honor. If one member suffers, everybody suffers. If one member is honored, everybody is honored. They rejoice. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Simon Peter's command is based on a supernatural affiliation found only in the body of Christ. Which is why when a church is full of lost people, things are shorted out. Right? There was a day in America where, and by the way, this preceded the First Great Awakening. It was the cause of the need for the First Great Awakening in New England the church is led by Jonathan Edwards' grandfather, developed this, this idea, this, this methodology that, hey, let's make people in the world sort of a halfway covenant member of our church. <laughs> because 
If we get them there, then they will at least hear the gospel and, you know, they will be, eventually, maybe they'll be converted. Now, what happened was, is the people that were granted that halfway covenant, well, you know, I don't want to be join a church because I'm not sure I believe in Christianity, but thank you for the offer, I'll accept that. I'll, I'll take your halfway covenant membership. They walk away from that. As far as they're concerned, they're members of the church. Hey, they're good to go. Problem is, they didn't know Christ. Let me tell you a little secret. The church will never, ever affect the world by allowing the world into the church. It just doesn't work that way. In every case... The church is the one that's affected. Same principle when you tell a young person, hey, you need to be careful who you marry, who you are joined with. Make sure they are a believer like you. Yeah, but we'll get married and I'll get to witness to him. Okay. What happens is, invariably, the unbeliever influences the believer. And before you know it, phew, they're out of church. They're not living for God. Same principle. When a church invites the world in, then they're not affecting the church. The world is affecting, they're not affecting the church. The world is affecting the church. So, sympathy, the range of it. One thing is clear. Sympathy and selfishness cannot coexist. So long as the self is the most important thing in the world, there can be no such thing as sympathy. It depends on a willingness to forget self and identify oneself with the pains and sorrows of other people. We can talk big, we can express it on Facebook, we can make all the sentimental statements we want to, but until it's lived out and we suffer along with them, it's not real Christian sympathy. And that's a, that's a place most of us have never really been. There's a second idea here, and I'm just going to introduce this, and, and it's it's the idea of brotherly love. It's actually the third one in his list. Finally, we have one mind. That's Christian unity. Having compassion one of another, that's Christian sympathy. And then number three, love as brethren. Okay, so that's brotherly love. But again, what's the context? The context is loving the brethren. Who are the brethren? It's not the world. We're to love the world. But they're not the brethren. The brethren are here. Look around you. These are the brethren. You love them to the highest degree possible. That's what brotherly love is. Now, Jesus said it this way, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love for, and again, does he say love for the world? Nope, he says love for one another. John remembers that as the Holy Spirit's inspiring him. Later on in the New Testament, he says this in 1 John chapter 3. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Who, he who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. He again says in chapter 4, if anyone says, I love God and hate his brother, his brother's not in the world. His brother's in the church. This is not a statement for the world. It's a statement for us. If a man says he loves God, hates his brother, I love the subtlety of John. He, he, he pulls back here. He's a liar. <laughs> hmm. There's a lot of people lie about their Christianity. Lie about their faith in Christ. They say one thing and live out another. This is interesting. The simple fact is that love of God and love of man go hand in hand. Now, don't get me wrong. We are called to love the world. Yes, yes. But you can't claim to even love the world if you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ and act like it. You see the disconnect there? And you, you got to want to be here on top of that. Here I am preaching to people who didn't go on vacation. It's raining and you came today. But you understand what I'm saying. There are a lot of people who really could care less. Couldn't care less. Whether they're here or not. They don't love the church. So using John's logic, they don't love God. It's that simple. Recently, one of my former students posted a meme. Some of y'all get your theology from memes. I don't. 
okay? But this one caught my attention. And he commented on it, and rightly so. The, the meme said this, the true test of Christianity is not loving Jesus, but whether we love Judas. Okay, that sounds so woke and hip and modern and, yeah! But God, God makes us love Judas. <laughs> and we ignore what Jesus said. People will know you're my disciples if you love your brothers. That means a lie. It's a twisting of scripture. By the way, most of the time when somebody says something like that, what they're trying to do is, is, is approve of some ungodly lifestyle. Well, you can't keep saying that this is sin or this is sin. We have to love Judas. Okay. Let me ask you something. If Judas had changed his mind, who would have betrayed Christ? Because it was God's will that he'd be betrayed. Let that blow your mind for a while. And by the way, they didn't know it. But Jesus did and let him hang around. Because Judah's purpose was to betray him. Oh my. You still want to love Judas? Because what most people mean when they say love Judas is don't give him too hard of a time over his betrayal. There's one man in history who in scripture is used as a prototype, humanly speaking, of the Antichrist. His name is Judas. You figure it out. But what does the Bible say? It doesn't say that. The true test of Christianity is whether or not we love each other. Somebody say amen on this rainy Sunday morning. Is that right? You believe that? I took Lori to a Braves game a couple weeks ago. She's a bona fide crazy fanatic. Second only to Theta Lindsay. And maybe some of you other people. Braves fan. So we're all excited. She's sitting there and, you know, she goes and gets, you know, something to eat. It's hot. And the food there is awesome, by the way. But uh, she, she sits back down and said, baby, look right here. Down there is Max Freed warming up. And there he was, just right down below us. Other guys came out. We saw them, you know, that kind of thing. But the big deal was first inning, who was the first baseman for the other team? Freddie Freeman. First series. Freddie Freeman was back in town. If you're a Braves fan at all, you know that big, long ordeal in the offseason. They wanted to keep Freddie. Freddie decided not to go. Now he says, I didn't know they wanted me that bad. And it's just sad. It's like a man who lost the love of his life and married somebody else. I mean, what do you do for a guy like that? But I watched him. If you've watched enough ball games, you've seen it too. It's pretty cool in person. Every Braves former teammate, that, well, every Braves player that got on first base, here's Freddie. Hey, man, how you doing? Got his arm around him. How's your kids? I didn't hear this. I'm guessing. But, I mean, you know, he's having this conversation with every single player. He does that. And then he immediately stretches out and hopes the pitcher throws the ball to him so he can try to tag his buddy out. You know, I got to think about that. That's exactly the way a lot of Christians are with each other. We pat each other on the back. Want to find out how each other's doing? In the back of our mind, though, we would tag them out in a heartbeat and cancel them out of our life if we could. Same thing, right? You say, well, that's baseball. Yeah, but that's exactly what we do in the midst and the bowels, if you will, of Christianity. We claim to love people. We claim to love God. But too often, we are willing to cancel somebody else out. That's not Christian living, especially not in the midst of persecution. Now, I'm going to leave this application with you because we, I don't know where else to go with it. There are other things to list we'll talk about next week. Here's the point. As things get worse and worse and worse, we are squeezed more and more and more. What is coming to the top? What's coming out of the spiritual capillaries of our soul? Because when you and I are squeezed, the truth will happen. What comes out? The next 
time we hear a Supreme Court ruling, it may not be favorable. What are you going to do? You're going to be like Job was for a little while. I'm just going to curse God. And, or his wife told him, I'm going to curse God and die. I'm, I'm so tired of fighting this battle. Really? <laughs> Jesus said, you follow me, it ain't going to be easy. And yet when we get squeezed, we are so unspiritual in so many different ways. And I think that's what the Word of God, like a laser, is focusing on right I passed for 30 years. I've seen it over and over and over again. Guess what? I've seen it in my life too. I know what I'm talking about. When the pressure's on, are you a blessing or not? Let's stand together. Heads bowed and eyes closed for a second. And Kelly, please come and play just one verse. I want to give an opportunity for these folks here. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what the pressure is in your life. You don't know what it is in mine. Holy Spirit knows. Here's the question. The last time you were squeezed, was you a, were you a blessing to others? Or were you a detriment to others? Were you a blessing to the church? Or were you hurtful to the church? You're the only one knows that. Maybe some of you did public things, and I don't know about it, you know about it, whatever. Simon Peter says, listen, here's how you got to live. When the pressure's on. Lord, take these words this morning. Thank you for the truth that is found only in the Word of God. Lord, we as your people are called to be a blessing. Do not let us shirk that. And being a blessing includes having spiritual qualifications be exerted and lived out in our life when the pressure's on. God, the next time we're squeezed, I pray that vileness and anger and wrath will not be what's seen. But, Lord, that it will be the sweetness of the grace of God that's changed us, realizing that we can sin in any way. We are failures apart from the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Realizing that, then we can do what Simon Peter says. Lord, may we always love each other more than ourselves, so that the world will know we belong to you. In Jesus' name. As Kelly plays and nobody looks. Opportunity is here. If you'd like to come and pray, whatever the need is of your heart, I invite you to come. Appreciate you being here today. Again, if this is your house key, you might want to come get it. If it's not, leave it alone. Don't get this and go try on everybody's door, okay? You'll recognize it with a flashlight. All right, so church, have a wonderful week this week. We'll see you Wednesday night, okay? Uh, deacons, after Wednesday night, need to have a meeting. Uh, can't do it before, but after, okay? So important things coming up. Want to get a jump on it. I love you. Love each other always. Park. Dismiss us in prayer, brother.